let's start. So welcome to lecture uh, seven. So today we'll talk about neurosurgery and surgery cases. And we'll be guest lectured by Peter Sijersjö and Gunnar Gunnarsson, both from the Department of Neurosurgery at Skåne University Hospital. So uh, the same conflicts of interest as previous uh, uh, days. So the outline of, for the day will be experience of neurosurgery applications in 3D printing here at uh, School University Hospital. Uh, and then I will perform two uh, live cases. And we, as usual, we end up with questions and answers. So with that, I hand over to Peter. My name is Peter C. I'm a consultant neurosurgeon at the Department of Neurosurgery in Lund. Um, this is a regional clinic and we take care of all the cases from the southern Swedish catchment area. Uh, before we are going to present some cases for you and I have with me Gunnar Gunnarsson who is a <clears throat> technician at the, um, and also a, and a certified nurse at our department. I will go through some things you might want to know about um, how the skull bone in the, on the cranial vault heals. Now, if you've learned from bone from other parts of the body, it actually heals uh, fully in all ages. It is not the case with the skull bone. The skull bone rarely heals um, in the whole uh, circumference of, for example, craniotomy, a craniotomy, and it's when we take away bone to access the interior parts of the skull. So in children it can heal fully, but in adults it does not. So it stands there as a foreign body, in a way. It does not get vascularized. This also makes it prone for infection and resorption. So that about bone healing and that uh, so why do we need 3D printing? Well, uh, we have several cases when the skull bone is, so to say, lost. And um, firstly, we remove the skull bone to decrease the intracranial pressure, mostly in trauma, but also in stroke and other cases. We then try to preserve the patient's own bone by freezing it and then putting it back. This involves a second surgery and there's also a risk for a new infection or an infection and also for resorption. So um, the failure rate is at least 20% of these ones that are put in. We can also have to take away bone because of an infection after a previous um, surgery and um, we can also need to take away bone because there is growth of tumor in the bone. So in all cases, we need to replace the bone. If we have growth of tumor or there is an, an obvious infection, we cannot, in most cases, replant the, the, the autologous bone. There is a possibility of sterilizing, but it's not feasible logistically nowadays. So in the first case, trauma, where we want to re <clears throat> reduce the pressure, we can put the autologous bone back. In the other cases, we can't. So we have to make a some kind of bone substitute. The, the most common one is to free model uh, a malleable plastic um, that uh, will replace the skull bone. This is done normally freehand, uh, and in some cases, it's really difficult to get a good cosmetic result. And that is the impetus for uh, doing 3D printing. Um, in the long run, we hope to be able to 3D print uh, full implants. In, in, as it is now, we are making molds where we can uh, mold the plastic to get a better fit and also to speed up the time uh, when we have the, um, the uh, the dura and things exposed because that is also a factor of infection. So now Gunnar will, together with me, present two cases and feel free to answer to pose questions after that. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Gunnar and I uh, work as an image uh, nurse at the Department of Neurosurgery. I've been working with Peter for 26 years in this field of uh, digital imaging. Uh, 
we would like to show you uh, what we call the baking process when we uh, put the uh, acrylate uh, into the mold. And uh, this is, uh, in this case, done uh, in a non-sterile uh, environment, just so you could get the idea. Okay, this is the Palacos kit. Uh, this, uh, the price for this is uh, about uh, 900 uh, kroner. And uh, uh, there is air added to this uh, tube and uh, the mixing process starts. We have noticed that it's very important to apply water, a lot of water during this baking process. So Peter has uh, made a, a small cake here and uh, uh, he makes the, the surface smooth and with a dissector he uh, cuts the uh, redundant uh, material. Uh, we had uh, in the beginning, we, we were a bit afraid that the, the acrylate plastic thing would uh, fasten in the mold. Here you can see that it's not really hardened as it, uh, and that there's a process that takes about uh, 15 minutes or so. But this looks like a very nice uh, implant. It's now it's Petrosisha, the neurosurgeon again, and we will present the case. Um, the mold and that is because we had to take away a more bone. We have in later cases made more specific uh, guidance dummies so we can we can really delineate how much bone we want to take away and then use the mold and I can show you if you see this one here this is a kind of guide which you can use and we can orientate it and put it onto the skull bone and then get an exact drilling of um, yeah, there you see it. Okay, um, so that is um, what we have done and um, as you can see there can be um, 
changes made to this technology um, that um, eases up the process. And one of them is Aina is going to talk about how to make better molds, how to, because, because you, to make it sort of semi-automated because you can see that even though we have these um, molds, we have to sort of hand shape them on the outside. Uh, and I could also add that at, at the more the, the curvature on the scale, the more difficult it gets to make a, to make a hand mold, and especially around the eyes in the orbits. Uh, there we have had a fantastic help of that. And uh, although we've only used this for a year, I know, is it? Yeah. We started in April, yes. Yeah. It sort of came come into clinical practice so much that we actually found out that it was impossible for us to do a randomized study because it's been so accepted already. <laughs> and, and that's uh, both a, a pro and con. Uh, but we, of course, we, we would like to test it in a randomized study. We'll try to do in, in other ways. Maybe Aina will tell something about that. Okay, I will hand over to Aina then again, and uh, we'll, uh, Gunnar and me will be available for questions at the end of it. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you, Gunnar and uh, Peter. So, uh, I will switch gears, and uh, there we go. So, now you should be able to see my screen. So, I will present two cases. <coughs> I will... Uh, start with a similar case. Uh, so we can take, uh, this can start with this case. So this is um, one of the first cases we, we did, uh, but I, I will redo it now. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so the first, what I do in the software is I, I always uh, first check that um, it's isotropic uh, sample for for skulls. Uh, the next step is to uh, orient the, uh, uh, so I will straighten it up a bit. Something like that. Uh, we can test in the sagittal view, in the coronal view. Uh, maybe apply. You still see, see the screen? Yes. Okay, so now straightened up. Uh, first, I will do a skull segmentation. And then we can see how that looks. See so the case, a, a quite uh, uh, big uh, hole from previous surgery. So we'll now make a mold of this. So what we do is start our uh, tool for that. So the first thing is we did determine where to, where to start. So here, the deformity end starts here, so it's over that, and then here, here we can see it. So I go down to stop see it. That makes some even the set of planes. This is going to be right to left mirror, so we'll mirror the right side to the left side. Uh, put the set, approximate center marker, and then. Rotate a bit, translate it, and you can see it seems like a good mirror position. So what I will do now is I first make an outside segmentation at the outside of the skull, and then uh, here manually put in the, the thickness I want, so seven millimeters maybe we could there. Uh, and, then, and here it misses a bit, so I can just make small uh, changes. And then I work myself sort of downwards here. Uh, here I decrease the thickness, six millimeter maybe. And then I 
again, I think five millimeters is more better here. Uh, yes. We try to never go uh, under four millimeters of thickness uh, for the molds for because of the screws we used to attach them are uh, three millimeters. Uh, and now we're, we can interpolate uh, this surface so and we can also check how it looks in different coronal positions. Okay, and then we're ready to compute. So now it computes a, a mold and also it computes a, um, an implant. Okay, close this. So uh, we can remove some objects we don't need. Uh, okay, so here we have uh, the implant that will fit uh, to this. And there's only minor modifications you might need to do, to do in this. Uh, maybe, maybe some to ensure that it, it's, uh, it's not too conical. And here we get the mold. Uh, and to print this, uh, what we typically uh, want to do is, uh, it's important to ensure that the, uh, there are not sharp edges um, here. So here the material can get inside and get stuck. So typically, I. Uh, uh, we do some manual uh, changes here to fill this part. So uh, otherwise, I think. Maybe, maybe slightly here. Okay. Uh, and the next part is now is to uh, make something that we can nicely print. So what I do then is I put some points on, on the edge. And then uh, we want to make a crop from that. Uh, first, uh, actually, I will ensure that it's filled. Uh, let me see here. So uh, I think it's, it's better to make sure. So there are some part that is not completely filled. Uh, so I typically start. So I just fill in the plane here and then we can fill in 3D. Okay. Uh, what I will do now is to make it easy to print so uh, our models are quite usually hollow. Uh, so it doesn't take th that much material. Okay, so now we have a hollow and now we can uh, go back to cut it. And then I want to cut this in an oblique plane. First, select the points I want to cut along. Uh, uh, this is the part I wanted to have. And it, now we're all almost uh, close to, to the final mold that we can print.
so the only steps left would be to, to write the patient IDs, etc. on here, and maybe some orientation markers. Uh, so that will conclude um, the first case, uh, and I think we can actually show you a bit on how they 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 look uh, right now. Uh, I don't know if you see this also myself, but this is how they would look. For the next case, close like this. Uh, I'll open here. So this is a case that we'll do surgery on in two weeks. Uh, uh, so again, shake it isotropic. Uh, it seems to be quite good uh, oriented as well. So we can um, uh, start with making a bone seg segmentation. And here we can see uh, uh, this case, and uh, it's uh, so this is an osteoma. So what we want to do is take away this this part, and then we we need to remove that part, so we cannot put it back. Uh, so we need we need to make a mold. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is uh, put some points that will show about uh, where. When this will go. I will switch to uh, this. So you can also see here in the CT how it looks in the CT. You can see uh, this is the part that we want to get away. What I now is can create a, a line from these points. So here's a line and if I want to kind of adjust the line slightly. Adjust it, uh, and now we want to have some safety margins. Uh, so I ask the computer to put it out 10 millimeters, uh, and we can ensure that this line is uh, sort of snapped down. Now we'll cut along this line. So I must much faster than the resurgence cutting. So we get the new part where this cut. We select here that only to take uh, the skull part. So now we have uh, yes. This is the skull with the hole. So here there will be a lot of objects uh, trying to keep track of them. So we can take away uh, these two parts. There's a skull with a hole. <clears throat> okay, uh, now I want to create this filled skull. Uh, so I go back to the original one. Uh, and I want to explain to you later why I want to fill it. Let's go something here. I switch to transversal view and I said fill in 2D and then I can fill uh, in 3D. So we can see I got the filled filled skull. Uh, that I should not have done on that, sorry. Uh, so first I make a copy and then I fill it. So, and I call this uh, skull filled. So, if I now take the skull, uh, uh, take the skull, and then I uh, sub subtract them from uh, from each other. I get sort of the inside. I can get what we could call basically, basically I get the, uh, the brain. Uh, 
and then I can uh, take the largest part of that. So get away all the uh, things here. Uh, I want to hide this, and then we make it a bit smoother. Uh, to get this nice surface, and uh, and then also try to make it a bit bigger. So here, I make it maybe three millimeter, three point five millimeters bigger or something. So you can see uh, this should go partly into the bone like this. So that's good, and maybe a bit smooth from that. So okay, uh, so if I now combine my skull, so we can call this, uh, let's call it uh, inside, and we can take away these uh, temporary parts that we don't need. So if I combine my inside uh, with the hole, I will get uh, the mold as I want, and then uh, again I can cut it as I did on the previous case. Um, okay, so now we created the mold. Now we want to create uh, a small ring uh, to, so for the surgeons to place on the skull and really see where it should uh, open to fit the mold. Uh, and then I take the filled uh, skull again. I take the filled skull. And now I want to create this, what we can call maybe a helmet. Uh, so. Uh, I want to have it, let's say, six millimeters thick. I want it to have it outside. So now, this would be a sort of helmet uh, for the subject. So this is uh, now outside. Uh, and we look in 3D. And we watch the points. And we watch the uh, here. OK. Uh, and then we fit snap it. So now actually this line is actually transparent. I made the part transparent, so it's basically from the inside. So I cut here in the helmet. Like this. Um, and I take, and now we can go back to the skull. So here's a line, and now if I move the line out, maybe 12 millimeters or so, or something like this, there, and we go back to the already cut helmet, and then we cut it again. So now I have created a, a ring that we can pick. So uh, we can take away this point, or points we can keep. Uh, maybe slightly, slightly smoothing on that, but not much uh, to get a bit nicer. So this is the ring uh, for neurosurgery, and we can rename it to call it ring, or cutting guide, or whatever we would, call, would, would like to call it. We take away some of the parts we don't need, and we can try uh, on, uh, yes, this is the mold, so we should rename it to that. And we can try the ring on the mold. And we can see, yes, it fits perfectly to, to the mold. And here we can see the, the surgeons should draw inside. And it's much easier to hold the ring and draw inside and then hold the ring and draw outside where you want to make the cut. Uh, now we want to place some anatomical markers. Uh, so we can use them for, for neurosurgery, for neuro navigation. Uh, 
so something like this. So uh, again, we use the point tool. Uh, so I put one point maybe maybe here, one here, one here, and then uh, I can make uh, what we can call it sort of pegs on those. So we want to make drill a hole maybe 10 millimeters down or 10 millimeters down and 15 up and then let's make it three millimeters diameter. So we've got a new part that we can then subtract from the ring. So get uh, holes in the ring. And we can actually also subtract that from uh, the mold. So we can see uh, how the ring will, will fit on, on the mold. Then. So what we will export to the neural navigation is uh, the, the standard CT. And then we put this on top. So we can import it to the neural navigation system. And then the uh, surgeon can put the marker here and here and then rotate this uh, ring until it fits uh, com compared to what we expected on, on the on the plan. Uh, and when it's fixated, draw a line on the skull and then use this line as a guide for making uh, the cut into the, into the bone. So uh, if we put the ring uh, together on the skull, it will, it will look something like that. So when we open the skull, uh, this is bit how we will see. We put the ring, and then rotate the ring so it fits on the on the planned uh, CTs, and then we can remove this part, and then we have a ready mold for doing this. Uh, so with this. Uh, I think we are ready for some questions and answers, and then I will also have uh, Peter here to uh, help me with those. So, Philip, have have we got got any questions on the um, chat yet? Uh, yes, there was a question from Wolf. Uh, which material do you use to print the skull bone? Uh, um, okay, so the skull. Um, so right now we're not printing the skull bone. So right now we're printing the molds. Uh, we will print it in uh, or working on on peak uh, to print it in peak. And we have um, a peak uh, printer for this, and uh, it's merely the regulatory aspects that we are look, waiting for. And the neurosurgeons are really eager waiting uh, for this. Uh, yes, and he also had a follow-up question. Uh, which material do you use to print the ring? Uh, so the rings and, and those materials uh, we all print in uh, on the Formlabs printer in the surgical guide. Uh, first we started with, with dental surgical guide, but now we use only the, the surgical guide. Yes, uh, Vasilis asks which navigation system do you use? Um, so the, 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 which navigation system we use? I think uh, Medtronics. Medtronics. so. It's, it's Medtronics. It's, it's really Gunnar who is the expert here. Uh, yes, Hannah asks uh, for the osteoma. This means only one operation with a ready implant and cutting guide. Um. So, so uh, can I say the, the question again? So for the osteoma, uh, what? Uh, uh, I think maybe Hannah should uh, explain more about the question. Uh, I guess she means uh, uh, that we have only made one of these operations. Oh, uh, how many osteomas do we have? Uh, with, uh, with a cutting guide. This is the second one. It's quite a rare tumor. Yeah. Nine. Yeah. Uh, so we have this um, the young kid, and this is the second one, right? And that was a fibrous dysplasia. Yeah, for, for, for both the dis displacer as well. So in that sense, it's the it's the we third. Have many tumors. We can have metastasis. Did you see here? You were asking about what kind of lesions or 
she no, she made a correction. Uh, the, was this the only operation for this patient? Yes, yes. Um, but we can have different kinds. We can have meningiomas, metastasis, um, other tumors that grow into the bone. So it doesn't really matter. We want to get rid of that bone to stop recurrence of the tumor and take away the disconfiguration of the skull. And we want to, we cannot sterilize the bone as it is now, so we have to reimplant something. And she also has a follow up question. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and faster than without the cutting guide and implant? What? Uh, is this faster than you, without the cutting guide and the implant? Yes, it is. It is. Um, because um, what you can do with the cutting guide is also that you can actually um, def decide how much bone you have to take away. Uh, if you don't do that, you have to go with the navigation system and check for every point that you're free of the tumor. Now you can decide this before surgery and fix the cutting guide. Uh, great. She also asks uh, approximately how much faster do you think it is? Uh, well, the whole procedure, we think it's around 20 to 40 minutes faster, but it depends on what technique you have. Now we're elaborating to actually to, to mold the implants before we open the skin and uh, to keep them sterile. And that, because the, the time, the exposure time of the wound is crucial. So uh, normally, uh, the surgeon opens up the wound, uh, takes away the bone that should be taken away and has to also to adjust the edges and so on. And that is done while the, the wound is open. That can sometimes be over one and a half, two hours. So, I mean, minimum 20 minutes, maybe even more 40, 50 minutes. We are going to do a study to exactly show that, but it's just, that's what we know now. Yes, great. Hmm? Uh, so. For the skull defects, do you plan for a margin between the defect and the implant? Yeah, we plan for a margin of, the, of at least five millimeters, uh, something around that. It's depending on, on what we are dealing with. And if there should be um, some suspected material at the edges, we can easily drill that off. Um, but I mean, we. We, we plan to go free for five millimeters. It depends on the area also. Great. Uh, do you still need navigation if you have the cutting guide? Uh, well, um, in some cases you would not need it because if there's a clear lesion and you have an orientation, you can put the cutting guide over, but we would not. In the beginning, we tend to use navigation just to verify the position, but it might well be that you could do it without, yes. There was, there is a question from Prashant Ray. Uh, have you tried 3D printed titanium cranial plates? How was it? Uh, no, we haven't done that well. I'll pop, pop over to Einar. Uh, he can get some input. Yeah. Yes, so it's, uh, I so repeat the question, please, Philip. Yes, so the question was, have you tried 3D printed titanium cranial plates and how was the experience with it for intraoperative adjustments? Um, so we haven't uh, tried titanium. Um, and I think we actually will use peak rather than titanium. Um, both, both materials have weakness and strengths. Uh, and titanium is both both peak and titanium, you wouldn't be able to do any adjustments uh, during surgery. Um, so uh, we don't have more experience with that. And I don't think we will at the hospital have a titanium printer for many, many years to come, uh, but we already have a peak printer. Yes, and there was a question from Wolf. Uh, when you form the peak material, you would print a mold form first to fit the peak material, correct? Which material do you use to print that mold? Okay, no, for for um, uh, for, for if we, we will for the peak print implants that we will do later, they will be we will print in peak directly. Uh, so we have a dedicated uh, printer, uh, Opium two M two twenty. 
that it's uh, medical grade that we'll use to print uh, uh, the peak directly. So we'll not mold the peak. Uh, and the nice part with the peak is that there's no problem to autoclave, etc. Right, great. And uh, there are no more questions right now. Okay. Um, if there's no more uh, questions today, so it was, it was slightly shorter today, but it's good so you can get some lunch. Uh, so I would like to remind here that uh, it's still open for try your segmentations on your own. Um, so we'll send the emails previously to, the, to those to, to sign up if you want to get uh, a license. Uh, the I email will come out later tonight uh, on um, download links, etc. Uh, so that's, uh, I got some questions on that earlier today. But they, they will be sent out uh, apparently uh, later tonight. Yeah. There was a, uh, a follow a question mm -hmm. uh, from Prashant Ray. Uh, any experience with PMMA molds? Yes, uh, I mean the the the, um, the bone cement that we talked about today. I think it's the same as PMMA. So uh, all the molds that we've been doing is basically PMMA. Uh, the plastic name is Palacos, uh, but the, chemically it's basically PMMA, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so the Palacos is uh, what would we call it in, in, in normal is like a plexiglass uh, but um, it, sh it sh should be equivalent to PMMA and then there's some antibacterial uh, gentamicin in it and also some some material to make it radio opaque uh, to be able to see it nicely on CTs. Great, thanks. Okay. Thanks for today.